breaking news, and it is monster news. Detroit is dealing Matthew Stafford to the L.A. Rams in exchange for Jared Goff. Hello. How you guys doing? What I feel every day being here so far is how badly this city um, wants and needs to win. You know, I'm now the quarterback here, and I'm excited to provide that. You know, this team, this city's been through a lot, obviously, in, in recent years and have had these gut punches. All I'm saying is the gut punches will stop. I didn't know it was a poor man's anything, but Goff, looking deep, wants it all, looking for the ball. But this is pretty special. We got the best fans in the world. They came out here and showed out. This guy showed up today in a big way, and he really has for a long time. And that's Jared Goff. That's just five. That's just five. We're doing this. Keep on going. Yeah. Over the top, they go, and it's a touchdown. Third and six. Goff looks it rip. A touchdown to Laporta. Here they come with five. There's the catch and touchdown by St. Brown. Head over heels for six. Goff looking to throw. Goff to the end zone. Touchdown. There's the snap. There's the knee. Lions are bringing the NFC North title back to Detroit. You get traded here three years ago. Describe to me this turnaround Detroit has had. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to. It's uh, it's a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work. <laughs> Excuse me. A lot of hard work, and uh, now can stand here, uh, NFC North champs. It's 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 emotional, but it's just the beginning for us. Hey, hey you all saw that banner out there? We got more of those things to hang now. Ooh. Let's go to work now. Win on three, one, two, three. Win. I just say it like this. All right? Hey, you're good enough for Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> and appreciate you guys more than you fucking know. I promise you that. I love you guys so fucking much. This is just the beginning, boys. This is just the fucking beginning. We got three more of these fuckers next week at home, at our place, against whoever the fuck wants to come in here. Let's go. Yeah. Win on three, one, two, three, win! Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Into the Lion's Den for the divisional round of the NFL playoffs. Very happy to have you guys back. Of course, on this show, we're going to be discussing the wild card round that went down last weekend. Uh, we had a lot of uh, interesting stories come out of that. Uh, we had some crazy weather. We had uh, a major upset. So a lot of stuff to discuss there. We'll go through all those games, how they went, what happened, maybe some fallout. Also, we're going to be taking a look forward at the divisional round, which has some really good matchups coming up in that. We'll discuss any injuries that are currently uh, being reported for those matchups as well as uh, just what else we can be expecting as far as head-to-head -head between the, the, the teams. So I've got a full breakdown there, like I always do, and uh, so cannot wait to get to that. But first, I want to thank you guys for the views. You guys continue to uh, view the show. This past week was another big, big show uh, as far as viewership went. Uh, both sides, the video and the audio formats, were um, very good numbers, so I think that really tells me that you guys are doing what I'm asking you to do, and that is sharing the show with your friends and family, and uh, and they're starting to check it out too. So I really do appreciate that. That's how we get it going, um, and keep it going, keep it going strong. So very happy about that. Uh, let me tell you real quick, if you guys, if this is your first time checking us out, first of all, thank you, uh, but also how you can contact us if you have a question, a comment, a concern. We would love to hear from you. Suggestions. You guys are always giving me suggestions. So I appreciate those as well. I love any kind of feedback that you guys want to give me. So with that being said, let's tell you how to do it. So you can contact the show by emailing us, heavyhitterspodcast at gmail.com. You can also call the hotline, 1-616-258-6386. So when you can't get to sleep at night, and you've really got a sports question or a suggestion for another show um, on your mind, you can hit us up. It's available 24-7, 365. Again, the hotline number is 1-616-258-6386. You can also check us out on our website right there, heavyhitternetwork.org. 
Uh, very happy to have that up and running. All our shows are there. So that's really the one-stop shop if you want to go and find out what we got going on. I would highly suggest you go to the website. Um, also, if you enjoy what I'm doing, you want to support me and my cause, you can uh, click the QR code there, or scan it, I should say, uh, right to the right. Or if you're more comfortable, you can go to Venmo, search at Mario Romanelli, and that will allow you to tip the host. So I would appreciate any uh, anything you guys want to send my way. But uh, understand, it's just voluntary, nothing that you have to pay for on this uh on this network if you do want to watch us and maybe somehow you stumbled across this video somebody sent you a link you're like hey i want to go subscribe somehow well there's a couple ways you can do it you can go to rumble if you go to rumble you can search hh network or if you want to go to youtube you can search heavy hitter network as i always say you will not find all of the videos for heavy hitter network on youtube youtube is where we started it's, I've got still got a big following there, but uh, slowly moving everything away from YouTube because they've blocked me so many times. So if you want a one-stop shop, find every video we've put out. It is all at the website. But if you go to YouTube, if you go to Rumble, even if you go to the website, I always ask that you guys subscribe, share, and like because that makes the algorithms go up, which helps me. And like I said, it's always also available in audio format on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and so many, many more. And then another thing I want to tell you guys about is the upcoming project that we have in February. Spotlight Tribute is returning to the network after a year-long hiatus, which was not planned. And uh, I am excited to get back and start doing these shows again because these are ones that really uh, you guys seem to interact the best uh, out of all the shows that I do. This one always gets a lot of interactions, suggestions, um, feedback. So I really enjoy doing these shows. They're just fun to do, very laid back, and uh, just great music. And a little, uh, some nuggets too about songs that maybe you never knew. So that's why I do that. And also to try and get some uh, up and coming artists their shine uh, for free, you know, just trying to help the cause, push the process, and uh, and get people uh, noted. So very excited to get that show going. Again, that's going to be the start of February. So the first week of February, we will put out the first Spotlight Tribute in this four-part series, all going for the 80s music, and then March will be something new. But for right now, February will be all about the 80s. So a lot of stuff uh, to look forward to coming up on the network. Right now, I'm actually working on three different shows at one time. Uh, I'm wrapping up the, uh, of course, the Into the Lions Den as the playoffs is, is getting close. Super Bowl is getting closer. That will eventually come to an end. I've also got the, uh, like I say, Spotlight Tribute that I'm working on to kick off in February. And then I'm also working on my baseball database, which will then launch uh, the return of the Fielder's Choice Baseball Show, which that also will be taking off in February. Uh, looking right now, probably second, uh, I should say middle of February is when you can look forward to the Fielder's Choice uh, Baseball Show coming back, and that's going to be a full preview of all 30 MLB teams, division by division. So we're going to have six separate shows before the kickoff of the MLB season with me breaking down each team, moves they've made, predictions all that good stuff so i did it last year if you want to go check those out go to the website again heavyhitternetwork.org and you can watch those today but let's do it let's get into it the review of wild card weekend start off by uh, talking about Saturday's matchup between the Houston Texans and the Cleveland Browns. Coming into this game, Cleveland really, in my opinion, having the number one defense uh, for most of the season. They were just really, really tough, and, and one of the main reasons why they were able to still make it into the playoffs despite 
all the injuries. So this is going to be an interesting, interesting matchup for sure. And the first thing I wrote down on this one was the start of something big in Houston. I think this uh, absolutely validates uh, what we've seen out of the Houston Texans this season. I think uh, you couldn't ask for a better matchup as far as to prove yourself. Uh, this was a legit defense in Cleveland, and Houston came out and and really showed just how potent they can be uh, in, in big game situations. Uh, the start of the wildcard weekend kicked off with a one-sided event where C.J. Stroud would end up becoming the youngest quarterback to win a playoff game. Just another record for C.J. Stroud. It's just something he's been doing all year long. Uh, meanwhile, the oldest quarterback in the playoffs, Joe Flacco, would struggle against the Houston defense. He actually would throw two uh, pick sixes on back-to-back -back drives in the second half, which just was way too much to overcome. Uh, Houston would win by a margin of 31 points. This was their biggest margin of victory this season. Uh, meanwhile, Cleveland's defense, uh, this was the most points they allowed this season, and this was the biggest margin of loss for them this season. So Houston took it to them. And yes, the turnovers uh, by Joe Flacco definitely did not help. But Houston on the um, offensive side as well, uh, you know, two two scores by their defense is 14 points, but they still put up another 31 on their offense. And they're just a very good young team. I can't say enough about C.J. Stroud. Uh, look, this guy, I, I identified him early on in the season, and you can go back and listen to the shows, but I was definitely on C.J. Stroud um, radar very early on, I saw something special in the kid, seemed like a leader, really was bringing up the players around him to be even better. And I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, could Houston even had even thought that they would be at this point, this season, this quick, when they took C.J. Stroud? They knew they were getting a good player, but they're getting so much more than just a good player. There's a lot of good players in this league. But I really see C.J. Stroud as a uh, just an inspiration and a leader, a leader, which uh, I'll have some discussions about who's maybe not a leader uh, later on in the show. But C.J. Stroud, look, this guy, absolutely everything that you would want in a football player, and uh, he just does it consistently. And this was a, definitely another just breakout moment for him and this team to uh, state claim to just how good they really are. So under the spotlight for this game, CJ Stroud, 16 to 21, 274 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, no sacks, 157.2 quarterback rating. Nico Collins, also a beneficiary of CJ Stroud's success when he got six receptions, 96 yards and a touchdown. And then Christian Harris on the defensive side of the ball, eight tackles, one sack, Two tackles for losses, one pass defended, one quarterback hit, one interception, and oh yeah, a touchdown. Full day for Christian Harris, and uh, just a great game for the Houston Texans. Next game on the day was the Miami Dolphins taking on the Kansas City Chiefs. And this was a, a game that I think a lot of people thought was going to go high scoring. These are two explosive offenses, and well, that didn't happen. Uh, and the question I put out on this one is, were the Dolphins ever for real or beneficiaries of an easy schedule? Because that's been the criticism all season long was that, look, Miami could not win against good teams. They had an easy schedule. They benefited from it. They were explosive for sure, but the competition wasn't there. I think those questions have got to go back and, and you got to ask those again now. because. They looked really bad in this game. Temperatures, I think it was like negative four at game time. It was bad. It was very, very cold. But Kansas City did not have those problems. So, you know, and people talk about, oh, this team's coming in from Miami and they're playing in the cold. Look, all these guys come from different regions of the country. Let's be honest. Like, just because they play for the Dolphins doesn't mean they grew up in Miami. I mean, a lot of these guys probably grew up in cold uh, situations. So, again, it, I think that's overplayed at times about how teams are going to play because this is Miami. And it's just, yes, you're going to uh, get comfortable if you're constantly in Kansas City 
playing for the Chiefs, but it doesn't mean Miami just cannot compete. You know what I mean? So um, sometimes I think they just overstate that too much. But the Dolphins would attempt six, six <laughs> fourth down conversions and only converted three of them. They would also throw an interception in the first half. In the end, Kansas City was on a different level and playing in the cold weather, four degrees at game time may have given them an extra home field advantage, uh, depending on who you talk to. Kansas City also benefited by getting three first downs by penalties. Uh, just really, every which way, Kansas City beat the Dolphins. Kansas City would lead 16-7 to at halftime and shut out the Dolphins in the second half. Miami would have zero trips to the red zone. And uh, the spotlight in this one... Isaiah Pacheco, which we knew going in because of the weather conditions, they would need to get him going, and he did. 24 carries, 89 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, the team as a whole, though, 34 carries, 147 rushing yards, and, of course, a Pacheco touchdown. So really good day running the ball by the Chiefs. Uh, Rasheed Rice had a good day. Eight receptions, 130 yards, and a touchdown, which, again, all season long, it's been the talk has been who for the Kansas City Chiefs is going to step up at wide receiver. And really, to me, Rasheed Rice has been the consistent one all year long. And then and then George Karlaftis on defense, six tackles, one and a half sacks, one tackle for a loss, three quarterback hits, all leading to a 26-7 to Kansas City victory. Sunday, we had the Green Bay Packers heading to Dallas. Guys, I did not see this one coming. I I was looking for an upset this weekend. The one I picked didn't happen as far as Pittsburgh and Buffalo. This one did, and I'm not sure anybody, honestly, could have thought that this would happen, and especially to happen the way it did. Um, the The score... Closer than the game ever was. It's, it's one of those. When you look at the, if you just looked at the score, you'd be like, "Oh well, that was a pretty high scoring game." Was, no, 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 no. Don't get it twisted. Dallas was never in this game. Packers were playing with house money, and they went all in. Opening drive, they went twelve plays, converting their only third down out of the twelve plays for a touchdown. I mean, you talk about just moving down the field quickly and efficiently. That was Green Bay. Dallas would throw two interceptions in the first half. One of them went for a pick six by Darnell Savage. Green Bay led at halftime 27-7. to Dallas would end up scoring 25 points in the second half, but this game never fell at risk, even though the announcers tried their best to keep people tuned in. I, I can't stand it when the announcers do this. I uh, they did it again in, um, in a Detroit game this year, and I can't remember which one it was. But, I mean, you can just tell, like, well, if they just get two touchdowns and two two-point conversions and a... Come on. Like, sometimes you get it's okay to just say, look, this game's done. <laughs> They're done. And uh, it, it was pretty brutal to hear the announcers go on and on and on about how this thing, you know, well, if they just do this and that, it's, it makes them sound ridiculous and it makes you, as a fan, feel a little ridiculous sitting there through it and, and just, you know, kind of like, oh, well, maybe that could happen. Like... Look, the odds of that happening are very, very rare at that point. And um, me, I'm not going to turn the game off because I, I do this show and I want to make sure I see everything that happens and take my notes. But yes, if I was just a, uh, somebody that didn't really have any stake in this game and uh, didn't have to do a show talking about it later on, yeah, I would have turned this thing off probably third quarter. Um spotlights for this game jordan love let me give jordan love some love like look this is a guy i didn't believe in early on in the season and at, for a moment there he made me look right he he wasn't playing his best football but i'll be the first to admit that he has turned that around and uh i i really really like what i've seen from jordan love over probably the last five weeks of the regular season i mean he's been doing this now pretty consistently and really I think he just feels comfortable in his in his own skin now. I think early on and we had you know I had talked about it. 
Green Bay didn't have a great running game. They were putting a lot on Jordan Love's shoulders. I think too, too much too soon. But through it all, he's weathered the storm. And he's now got confidence. And he's a major factor of why this team ended up in the playoffs down the stretch. So nothing but respect for Jordan Love. Uh, 16 to 21, 272 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, no sacks, 157.2. Aaron Jones, another big piece of why Jordan Love is having success because he's running the ball very well. Had a huge day in this game. 21 carries, 118 yards, three touchdowns, and he also caught a pass for 13 yards. Romeo Dobbs, another great game for him. Six catches, 151 yards, one touchdown. Uh, for the Dallas Cowboys, look, Dak Prescott, 403 yards, three touchdowns. But again, this team was never in the game. They never were in this game. And the Dallas Cowboys have a lot of questions. I'm telling you right now, Jerry Jones, in my opinion, is going to make a change. Head coach, I don't know. But I am, I am saying this. Bill Belichick, and this was a discussion I had on the uh, Facebook group page. Bill Belichick is available. Bill Belichick wants to go to an owner that wants to win, guaranteed. Bill Belichick has never had an owner that really went out and spent a ton of money on roster. When you really think about it, New England wasn't the ones that would always go out and grab the biggest free agents. A lot of what they did was thanks to Tom Brady. Could we see a Bill Belichick, Jerry Jones uh, hookup here? Just throwing it out there. I think to me, it makes a lot of sense, but somebody's got to take the fall for this because there's no way going into this game, Dallas at home, coming off a great season, pretty healthy, no reason this should have happened. So uh, Green Bay led by 32 points with six minutes to go. And that is still when the announcers we're trying to tell us, yeah, 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 don't turn it off because they're still in there. There's still a chance. Now, yes, they were half-heartedly saying that, but at the same time, you could tell they did not want to lose the ratings, and they're trying to, you know, keep the, the eyes on the screen. Dallas had scored 16 points in the last six minutes to close the gap to make it look somewhat respectable, but uh, we all know this game was never respectable. Los Angeles Rams, Detroit Lions. Monkey off the back? Eh, the season wasn't about the past. The season was about the future. And that's something that this team has said pretty religiously throughout the season is that, look, all this stuff about how long it's been since we've made the playoffs, how how long it's been since we've had this many wins, how long, they're not carrying that baggage, and that's the smart way to go about it. Who cares? That's in the past. And this team really is focused on the future and the present. And this team right now is playing some great football. Yes, you had the matchup between Matt Stafford and Jared Goff, and there's great storylines there. But at the end of the day, this was just two good, I thought, evenly matched teams coming into this one. Goff outplayed Stafford head-to-head, -head, made a clutch pass to St. Brown to put the nail in the coffin down the stretch. Aiden Hutchinson had a two-sack performance in his first NFL playoff game. Lions defense had seven hits on Stafford, five coming from Aiden Hutchinson. So this young talent that this team has is absolutely already paying off. This is through the draft. A couple free agents, you know, David Montgomery. But this team has been built the right way. Finally, the front office of the Detroit Lions has, been, has had people come in that absolutely know what they're doing, care about the city, care about the team, and, and they're they're reaping the rewards right now. This team is stacked. This team has uh, money for next year to spend. So this team isn't going to really lose out much on the offseason. This team will repeat um, uh, next year with a lot of good talent still. 
So that's that's the good part about this. But what a, what a game for Jared Goff. And the crazy part about it, <laughs> I go to work the next day, and the first thing out of one of my coworkers' mouth was, man, I wish we had Stafford back. And I said some ex- expletives that I probably shouldn't have. But my point and my frustration is, what does Jared Goff have to do to get some respect? Like, I have nothing against Matt Stafford. Matt Stafford, I always was a huge Matt Stafford fan while he was here. I always supported him. But he's not here. Jared Goff is our quarterback. Jared Goff just went out and outperformed Matt Stafford. So why are we still worried about Matt Stafford? Jared Goff deserves all the praise for this season. So, yeah, I just, I don't get it. I don't get what Lions fans want. And to me, those are the old, just crotchety old Lions fans. Like the team has moved on. The team is not carrying that old baggage. And the fans, not all of them, but there are some old Lions fans that need to take on that same thought. Let it go. That's the past. I lived it. All my life, I've been a Lions fan. So I've been right there, guys. I can speak from experience. Yes, it's been a rough 46 years of my life watching this Lions team. But am I going to sit there and bitch and moan about 46 years that don't matter anymore? Because those are gone. Those are done. Those are in the books. It doesn't matter. Get a shovel and bury that stuff. I'm ready to look forward to the future. I'm enjoying this team now. So I was frustrated coming out of this game because I was like, man, we here we go. We got our playoff win. Our team looks good. And then you still got some of those old, grizzled, Lions, negative, negative feeling fans that just will never be happy. I guarantee you we could win the Super Bowl this year and they would come back and say something about, well, we got lucky or, well, we only, we should have won by more or, uh, we always negative. So to all those fans, go root for somebody else. Because for me, I'm riding with the Lions still and I support them fully. And I am proud of what they've done this season. And this party is not done yet because the Lions came out, they get the win 24, 23, um, and, and look, Stafford and Nakua, they had a great performance, but the Lions kept everyone else in control, dominated in the red zone. I think both coaching staffs came out with great game plans. The problem is only one team can win. And another thing that I will say positive about the Detroit Lions fans, the home field is absolutely now a true home field advantage. That crowd is so loud, so so just raucous, and you can tell it affects the visiting team. So that energy that, that those fans are bringing, absolutely amazing. And for all the lifelong Lions fans, this was special. They showed like the 86-year-old guy or whatever. Yes, for people like him, he now gets to see this team. What good would it do for him to go back 75 years and say, yeah, but 75 years ago, we, you know, nobody cares. It's the present. It's the now. It's the future. And this team's got it in spades. So four spotlights out of this game. Jared Goff, 22 for 27, 277 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions. He was sacked three times, 121.8 rating. David Montgomery, 14 carries, 57 yards, one touchdown. I love how this guy runs. Also had a catch for 11 yards. St. Brown, seven catches, 110 yards. Big game winning catch to keep that drive alive there in the fourth quarter. And then Aiden, Aiden Hutchinson, six tackles, two sacks, two tackles for losses, five quarterback hits. He played at that next level in a big playoff game, game changer. So these guys that are still young, many of these guys are still young, still learning. 
only going to get better. The future is bright for the Detroit Lions. Let's take a look at the rookie report. How did the rookies do in their first playoff game? Sam Laporta, three catches, 14 yards, did get a touchdown. Brian Branch, seven tackles, three of them solo, had a pass defended. Jack Campbell, five tackles, four of those were solo. And Jameer Gibbs, eight carries, 25 yards and a touchdown, plus four receptions for 43 yards. All these guys, a big part of the Detroit Lions' future. So my final take, red zone defense. Rams were 0 for 3 in the red zone. Red zone offense. Lions were 3 for 3. That was huge. That's huge. In a game like this, one point separation, there you go. Look at that. How did they perform in the red zone? Also, clutch kitchen, clutch kicking. Michael Badgley kicked a 54-yard field goal to extend the lead to 7 points at the 8:41 to go in the third quarter mark. Also, no turnovers. Huge. Campbell, good decision-making. Yes, he went for it on fourth down when we were at the goal line. And you know what? Had he not done that, we probably would have lost because we only won by a point. So I will, I will take that one. And look, had he missed the fourth down, we might be having a different conversation. But I will say this. He, that took guts in that situation that I, being honest, probably wouldn't have done. But he does, we get it, and we probably needed that. So there's a win for Dan Campbell. Um, but again, overall, good decision-making throughout the game. That one, yeah, you can argue, yeah, that, that one you need to go for. I don't like speaking about it now because it's going to, oh, well, yeah, of course you're going to say you should have gone for that one because he made it. Yeah, but at the end of the day, he didn't go for six of them like the Dolphins. I mean, that just gets ridiculous. And he punted when he should have been punting. Just a really, I thought, a really well-coached game for Dan Campbell. Run defense, also very, very good. 17 carries, 68 yards. That's all the Rams were able to get. So he held that running game in check. And just a good game for the Lions. Pittsburgh Steelers, Buffalo Bills. This is the game I thought we might have an upset. And I'm going to tell you right now, one of the big reasons I thought this was going to be an upset was because of the Pittsburgh Steelers running game. The problem was Pittsburgh fell behind early. They never really could take advantage of the running game they had. So I kind of knew I was in trouble as soon as they fell behind because I was like, well, the basis of what I thought was going to happen pretty much can't happen now. But thanks to a big snowstorm, this game actually moved from Saturday to Monday. With the absence of T.J. Watt for the Steelers, this really left the middle of the defense weakened, which you could tell. Josh Allen had a big day with his legs due to this factor, and even though the Steelers held on as long as they could, two early turnovers were too much to recover from, and that's really what allowed Buffalo to uh, jump out to a big lead early on. But between the 1 minute and 39 second mark of the second quarter, and the 6 minute and 27 marker in the fourth quarter, the Steelers actually outscored the Bills 17 to 3. So this game was actually a very good game by the Steelers. But again, when they when they couldn't rely on their running game, when they felt like they had to get back into this game quick, it really just kind of disadvantaged them. But at the end of it all, Josh Allen would throw three touchdown passes and scored on a franchise playoff record 52-yard touchdown run, which was ridiculous. Horrible, horrible, horrible tackling for the Steelers on that one, by the way. But a great play for sure. And look, when Josh Allen's locked in like he was on Monday, he is one of the best in the league. Now, he has his games where he doesn't look so good, but you know if you're seeing Josh Allen and he's playing like that, you know you're in for a long day because he can take over a game. And that's why he stands alone on my spotlight for this one. Because really, with what he did, how he played, that's the difference maker. That's the guy that deserves all the shine for this win. And Mason Rudolph, look, it comes to an end for him. We'll see what happens in the offseason with him. But 
the Steelers, the Steeler Nation, they all need to give this guy a big thank you because he really did save their season and got them into the playoffs with his play. So, yes, it comes to an end, but really um, it's just tough, tough for him because he'll probably end up being a backup somewhere. But this guy, I believe, has a lot to offer somebody. So I'll be anxious to see where he goes. Um, but yeah, when it's all said and done, Bills win 31-17 and uh, move on to the divisional round. And they're going to be a dangerous, dangerous team. And then finally, the Eagles and the Buccaneers. This was another upset I called. And this one I was right on. But it sounds like I was not maybe alone because I saw the pregame crew. Everybody picked the Buccaneers. And uh, you got to remember, I'm putting my show out on Tuesday, so I have to go pretty early with the predictions. And so this one, I was—I really didn't know how people would feel about this. I thought a lot of people would actually believe that the Eagles would wake back up and 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 beat the Buccaneers. But uh, at the time of the game, no, it seemed like everybody was kind of agreeing with me that the Buccaneers would win this one and win it. Boy, they did. The collapse was real. This Eagles team, my goodness, Philly played. The, with the same lack of energy that we have seen for the last seven weeks. This team was more, has more issues than just injuries. There was just a lot of pouting, head shaking from everyone, players, coaches. When, they got, when the going gets tough for this team, they just rolled over and died. Like To me, there is no leader on this team right now. I was embarrassed for them. When you see Jalen Hurts, and a pass doesn't get caught or he, he throws a bad pass. He just looks like the biggest baby. He just sits there and pouts and shakes his head and looks frustrated. It's like, dude, be a leader. Be a leader. I mean, this was in the first quarter I'm seeing this reaction from him. Same with the head coach. Like, everybody's just pissed off and, and pouting. It's like, you, you guys at one point were fighting to be the number one seed out of the NFC. And you guys went on a terrible run and still got your way into the playoffs. But you came out with that same negative, flat energy into this game in the first quarter. I knew the Buccaneers were going to win as soon as I saw the, the energy that the Eagles came out with. They didn't look like they wanted to be there. And when you're going against somebody like Baker Mayfield, who just leaves it all on the line, all on the field... We'll, we'll dive, we'll do whatever he's got to do. He can be banged up, and that guy's still playing 110%. That right there told me, yeah, Eagles aren't going to win this one. And it wasn't even close. Baker Mayfield would throw for three touchdowns, no turnovers. Buccaneers winning five of their last six of the regular season. They came into play. They were ready. They were charged up. Philly's defense would have more poor tackling all game long. While the Bucks D held the Eagles to 0 for 9 on third downs, 0 for 2 on fourth downs, and they shut them out in the second half. I mean, dominant. Second half, the Eagles had two punts, a safety against them, and two turnovers on downs. Eagles would score a late touchdown in the first half, which had people thinking, oh, hey, here we go. It's 16 to 9. Nah, it was done. They were done. So spotlight for this one, Baker Mayfield, 22 of 36, 337 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, was sacked four times, but had a quarterback rating of 119.8, plus 16 rushing yards, and then Rashad White also, just a really good day for him, 18 carries, 72 yards, and just a really nice piece to keep this offense moving. Um, and converting first down. So really, really good day for these two guys. Couldn't be happier for Baker Mayfield. I felt like he got really kind of shafted uh, in his previous spots of landing on other teams. But uh, like they said on the broadcast last night, look, this guy, the most comfortable he's felt in the NFL. And, and you can tell he's playing with a different uh, level of energy now and just really, really doing good. So the Buccaneers get to move on and the Eagles get to go pout amongst themselves at their home. So with that being said, this is who came in to the wild card weekend. And slowly but surely, you can see they started to drop off. And when it was all said and done, these were the six that were left. 
But with those six, we swipe the we swipe it clean and we bring in the new matchups. We got Houston will be taking on Baltimore. Green Bay will take on the 49ers. Buccaneers will take on the Lions. And the Chiefs head to Buffalo as we reset and get ready for the divisional round of the NFL. So let's go and take a look at the injuries that are coming into the divisional round. Texans, you can see, a little banged up there. Uh, Denzel Perryman, questionable with ribs. Uh, Jerry Hughes, questionable with an ankle. And Noah Brown, IR, he is out. So that's a big loss for them. As far as the Ravens go, uh, both of these guys, DeVerney and Andrews, on the IR, but I believe, I believe I heard that they're... Um, okay to return this week so we'll have to watch that closer and see again with me doing the show so early sometimes the injuries are, are tough to uh to lock in but look at the injuries here in the bills and chiefs game <laughs> we don't have to go through names yet. look at the amount of injuries that we've got here now a lot of these guys are questionable questionables usually do play especially in playoff situations uh these guys are probably going to play but there are a lot of banged up talent let's just put it that way in this game for sure so you can see the names there uh defensive side of the or uh, nfc side of the ball packers aj Dillon dealing with a neck injury jire alexander who got a big interception in that game this week in the wild card banged himself up again still dealing with an ankle injury we'll see what he can do but again i would think if he can go physically he's going to go look at this point of the season everybody's hurt it's just, are you injured or are you hurt? And if you're hurt, you can play. <laughs> so that's how that goes. 49ers, again, some big names there, but they're all questionable. So my guess is most of them will play. Uh, Mike Green for the Buccaneers is out with a uh, calf injury. And for the Lions, James Mitchell also out. Jerry Jacobs is out. To, uh, I wouldn't say Jerry James Mitchell is a big injury loss, but he is a guy that gets reps and a good blocking tight end. Uh, Jerry Jacobs, probably the bigger of the two there. And then Matt Nelson dealing with an ankle injury. Khalif Raymond still dealing with a knee injury. But both those guys are, at this point, questionable. So let's go head-to-head -head here. Let's take a look at these matchups. The first game we're going to see this weekend is the Baltimore Ravens and the Houston Texans. Saturday at 4.30 p.m. It all kicks off on ESPN. And uh, it's going to be a great matchup. Let's take a look at the offenses head-to-head. -head. Here you can see Baltimore, 12 categories out of 16. They lead the Texans. Now, remember, these rankings here, this is season long. This is the entire season wrapped into one. This is what these teams ranked for those categories. Some big ones that jump out off the board, rushing yards. Look at this. Houston Texans ranked 25th in rushing yards this season. Baltimore Ravens, first. Rushing touchdowns, also 24th to third. Yards after contact, 24th to ninth. So definitely there's a rushing advantage on the Baltimore Ravens side of the ball. There's no doubt about it. We look at the passing, and uh, you can see Houston leads that category. So this is definitely going to be... The two strengths, Houston passing, Baltimore running. But with Lamar Jackson, it's hard to say that they really struggle passing because he is a great passer as well. But no doubt about it, Baltimore with Lamar Jackson, uh, a very dangerous team on the ground. So weather conditions could play into this as well. That's something you got to watch for this time of year. If it's you know bad weather, then running teams, that's really where they get that advantage. So we'll take it, take a look at that, see how that all plays out for them. Also, I like to look at third down, fourth down red zone. In this, you can see Baltimore, pretty big advantage in all three of those. Uh, Baltimore ranked seventh, ninth, and seventh in those categories. Uh, let's take a look at the defensive side of the ball. Again, Baltimore leads in more categories than do the Houston Texans. 
but we saw the Houston Texans and they had a really good game against Cleveland. And so we'll see what they can do against Baltimore here, but no doubt about it. Baltimore, a pretty big favorite on the defensive side of the ball. Again, look at the rankings here, rushing touchdowns against Houston ranked 27th, Baltimore ranked first points allowed Texans ranked 10th, which is good but Baltimore ranked first. So, I mean, if you just go down the list there and look at these matchups, yeah, it's a pretty sizable advantage between the Ravens and the Texans. But like I like to do, what have these teams done lately? Last three games, how do they match up? You can see they are split 10-10. So a much different story when you just look over their last three games. Houston, defensive side of the ball, they have the advantage in the last three games. Baltimore has the advantage on the offensive side of the ball. But look at this. Rushing yards per game, Baltimore 122.7 to Houston's 82.3. Big difference there. Not as big of a difference in the passing game, 242 to 230. So uh, some of these stats, yes, you win it, but it's not by a huge margin. Third downs, look at this. On offense, Baltimore, 38% of the time they're converting on third downs. Houston, 31% of the time. Fourth downs, it's 100 to 0. Not sure if Houston even tried any in the fourth. I believe they did try at least one to get a 0% uh, percent in the stats I go off of. And then red zone is pretty close as well, 66.67 to 62.5. Baltimore has the advantage there as well. So, this really with these the way these two teams are playing in their last three, this tells me this is going to be a very close game. And I'm sorry, I'm beyond the point of even betting against CJ Stroud at this point. This guy is amazing. He does great things. I think both these quarterbacks are absolutely having just amazing seasons. And to see them on the same field at the same time with the big prize of moving on. It's, it's going to be a good game. This is a one heck of a game to kick off the weekend with Houston and Baltimore. I think it could be a very good game as far as, look, whoever wins this, you absolutely could see representing the AFC in the Super Bowl. I think both these teams are that good. So it's going to come down to turnovers. It's going to come down to maybe weather. There's going to be a lot of little factors that are really going to make the difference in this one. I don't see either one of these teams getting blown out. So it's going to be great. And in this one, I think I have to go and say, with everything considered, not getting glazed by the, the last thing I saw, I still give this one to the Baltimore Ravens, but I do think it's going to be a close game. Next game that we'll see on Saturday will be at 8.15 p.m. on Fox, and it will be the Green Bay Packers going to San Francisco. We should not have any weather uh, issues in this one, I wouldn't think. Uh, and let's take a look head-to-head -head here. 49ers, much more uh, impressive offense for the season. But again, if you look at the Packers' rankings, they're like middle of the pack for the whole league. And they had some really bad weeks there for a little bit, which probably really took them down. So, much closer, I think, than what this is showing us. And look, the 49ers have been red hot pretty much all year. They had one little spell where everybody got worried, and I think they lost like three in a row. And yeah, they didn't look great, but they, they were so far ahead of everybody else that that really didn't cramp their style. So we see that with the offense. We look at the defense, kind of same thing. Advantage goes to 49ers. Um, but again, some of these kind of closer, like passing yards against, 49ers ranked 13th, Packers ranked 14th. So very, very close there. Points allowed, 49ers ranked third, Packers ranked 12th. Third down conversions uh, defensively, you can see 24th and 28th. So I mean, very, very close. Red zone 15th to 12th, Packers. Um, so close in the big stats here that I like to look at. So over the last three games, look at this. Packers. 14 categories over the 49ers, four. So that's what I mean. Green Bay right now is very, very dangerous. And this one, to me, look, it'd be easy for me to say, look, 49ers have been the best team. I called it early that, hey, they're in Super Bowl mode. 
But to think I don't have some hesitation by seeing this and by watching what we I just saw Green Bay do to Dallas. Look, Green Bay is dangerous. But when it's all said and done, I'm going with San Francisco. They're at home. They're well rested. And this has been a really good team, basically from the word go. Like I said, they had the one hiccup, but that was more due to injuries. I think they're healthy and they're at home. And as good as Green Bay has been playing, I think their ride comes to an end and the 49ers will move on. But again, Green Bay, great team. This could also be a very close game. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be because I really think the 49ers are just at a, a whole different level. Like there's being, hey, two good teams that are going to face off. And then there's just, look, this team's on this level, this team's on this level, and they both can be good. But the 49ers, to me, a whole different level. I think they get a pretty big win here against the Green Bay Packers. Sunday, we go to the Buccaneers taking on the Detroit Lions in Motown. This game will be on NBC Sports at 3 p.m. Thank goodness I get an early game. And offensively, we match them up for the season, and we see the Lions pretty much far and away uh, the better offense, which is not surprising because they've been that all season long with their head-to-head matchups. You can see why. They're basically a top five offense in every category uh, until you get down to like the third down conversions and stuff like that. But they they are a very high, potent offense. Um, So we will go to the defensive side of the ball, and you can see there – That's where the Lions usually have a difference of opinion with the other team. However, in this one, very close. If you look at total yards, Lions ranked 20th, Buccaneers are 19th. Passing yards against, Lions are ranked 30th, Buccaneers are 27th. Um, So close, closer in in that category. So what have these teams done over their last three? Boom, 10-10 tie. And they're split. I mean, it's it's very, very split. It's not like one's defense and one's offense. They're just split. So this has all the signs of being a very close game. Uh, again, with Baker Mayfield and the way he plays, this guy's in a fight every weekend, and he wants to win. He's got the grit that the Lions have been talking about all season long. Baker Mayfield brings that to the Buccaneers. I think with the Lions being at home, though, the Lions offense being so potent at times, I do think when it's all said and done, the Lions will win this game. Look, the Lions defensive, uh, the Lions run defense has been amazing all year. What we did to the Rams with our run defense to keep them in control, I think we can do against the Buccaneers. I think that makes a big difference. The other thing I like about what the Lions have done lately, the red zone. We've been very, very good on both sides defense and offensive side in the red zone. I think that makes a big difference in this game as well. So again, I'm going with the Lions, but uh, no disrespect to the Buccaneers at all. I just, I, I really think this is a great team. I like everything Baker Mayfield's doing, but I think at the end of the day, when you get into the playoffs, it's whatever team can run better. And, and then when you can close the gap or uh, lock the door, shut the door, whatever you want to say, once you get to the red zone, that's, again, a big factor. If you're kicking field goals and we're getting touchdowns, that's a big difference. And I think that we're going to see a lot of that this weekend. And then it's the Kansas City Chiefs taking on the Buffalo Bills in Buffalo. So, of course, weather could be a factor. However, we saw this past weekend, the Chiefs play well in the cold. So you can scrap that whole part of the equation, in my opinion. This game happens 6.30 Sunday night on CBS. So, again, not too late of a game for us old folks that can't stay up so late anymore. Um, But, uh, yes, this is going to be a great matchup. Offensively, you can see Buffalo comes in with the advantage, which, again, not a surprise. They've, again, been a top-five offense basically all season long, and they really uh, have control of these stats here. Um, especially third downs. They're the first top-ranked third-down offense on the season. So, And again, a lot of that, again, Josh Allen. When Josh Allen can pull it down and run for a first down, 
or they can push him across the line for first down. He's such a big guy, so athletic. It's very hard to stop Buffalo on first down or on third downs. So as long as they can keep it manageable third downs, Buffalo's dangerous, and I think Buffalo uh, definitely will be okay against the Chiefs. Now the Chiefs have a great defense, which we flip to that, and you can see they actually have the advantage. But again, look at the difference in the rankings. Not overly, not a big difference, not a huge difference. Um, so again, when you're talking apples to apples, oranges to oranges, whatever you want to talk, I think right now Buffalo looks like the better team. Last three games, boom, Buffalo, 12 categories, Chiefs, nine categories. Buffalo's is all offense, very uh, good on offense. Now the Chiefs can compete with that. But again, I think Buffalo being at home, and I do think Josh Allen is the uh, X factor in this game again. I think the Chiefs have had a very good defense, but with Buffalo being able to have Josh Allen take it, run it, and he seems very confident right now. He's playing at his level. You know, when you get Josh Allen locked in and he's playing his best football, he's a game changer. I think he's at that level right now. I think he'll show up that way for this game. And uh, so with that being said, I give this game to the Buffalo Bills. And this one actually could be a little bit of a gap in this one because Kansas City's offense has struggled uh, throughout the season. And I think once they get in the game of this magnitude against a team like the Buffalo Bills, I think there could be a sizable gap. So we'll see. But if I had to say, um, is this going to be a close game or maybe a two touchdown gap? I think we're looking more at a two touchdown gap in this one. So that is it. Uh, once again, I want to remind you guys before we log off here is uh, don't forget February is return of spotlight tribute tribute to the 80s and uh cannot wait to get those launching as soon as possible for you guys gonna be great shows i've already got a lot of it uh prepped and ready to go just have to put it officially on camera and, and get all the details worked out there but uh, they are being processed so there's no delay in uh, getting those done thank goodness <laughs> after all the promotion that would not be good uh, so cannot wait to do that. And again, guys, if you want to contact us, it's heavyhitterspodcast at gmail.com or the hotline is 1616-258-6386 or go to the website, heavyhitternetwork.org. And again, if you enjoy what I do, if you like what I do, if you want to support what I do, you can hit me on Venmo at Mario Romanelli or scan the QR code that you see on the screen or go to the website and click the tip the host button. But again, guys, this has been a great show. I hope you guys agree. Um, look, here we go. Divisional round. Anything can happen. But uh, I feel pretty confident with all my decisions on uh, my predictions that I gave you. I think a lot of the head-to-head -head, um, that we look at, it's, it's, it's meaningful, especially the last three games, because teams can go on runs in the NFL – I think all these teams deserve to be where they're at, but at the end of the day, uh, it's it's going to be uh, another crazy weekend, I'm sure, because you just never know what to expect. I mean, injuries, weather, uh, it's just you just never know. I ne look, Philly came in to the playoffs looking like garbage, but I still did not expect them to come in and play the way they did. So lackluster, you would have thought they would have came in fired up, but again, they didn't. And look what happened to them. They got eliminated. Uh, kind of my same thinking with Kansas City. Not the attitude so much, but look, they've had issues all season long with receivers catching the ball, just not having that explosive offense at times. Their defense has really gotten them to where they're at. Okay, now you play Buffalo, a good Buffalo team, a hot Buffalo team, a confident Buffalo team. So with that, I think, I think now Buff Kansas City gets exposed for the shortcomings they've had this season. So again, no disrespect, but I think it just you you now are going to get yourself in a fight that you're not capable of winning. So good stuff though, guys. And look, here we go again. One more round, and then we're gonna do it again next week. We're gonna get you ready for the uh conference matchups. We're gonna know who the final four are. It's gonna be fun. It's going to be fun. And look, once again, I want to promote this because I don't promote this very much, and I really do want you guys to go and join it. So when you get done watching this, go to Facebook, 
search HH Network. There is a heavy hitter network group. Do not join that. That's my old group. I got kicked off of there. I have nothing to do with that group anymore. It's HH Network under the groups for Facebook. Go join it and be part of the community. I actually posted something on there that uh, a guy says that basically you know who's going to go to the Super Bowl because the logo for the Super Bowl always represents the colors of the teams that end up going. If that is true, there's a good chance that this year's Super Bowl will be the 49ers against the Baltimore Ravens. Will it happen? We'll see. But that is what we are uh, being told, and there is a little history to that. Now, if that happens, I think it also tells you that the NFL is rigged, like a lot of us think it is uh, anyways, but that would definitely be a pretty big slam dunk toward that uh, conspiracy uh, if we do see the 49ers and the Baltimore Ravens. And look, they have looked like the two best teams this season for sure so we'll see but that is uh that's the rumor and if you want to see that video that i'm talking about then go to the facebook group page and you can find it right there again thank you everybody have a great night i'm in some crazy weather right now i don't know if any of you guys are too but if you are uh stay safe on the roads uh get out there and snow blow your driveway so you can get out and go to work and uh yeah stay warm i guess i don't know what else to say but uh, that's going to do it. So, guys, so uh, once again, thank you so much. Share the show, like the show, subscribe to the channels, and you guys will make my day. But until then, take care of yourselves and each other. But for now, I am out. In terms of playoff losses, where does this one rank for you? Well, I don't have, uh, uh, really, I can't reach back and look at a playoff loss. Uh, uh, but this uh, uh, seems like the, uh, the, the most uh, painful uh, because uh, we all had such great expectation and we had hope for this team and uh, uh, thought that we were aligned in a great shape, in great shape, and uh, uh, it didn't happen for us. And it's as fresh on me right now as it is on anybody else. But I, don't, uh, I won't get into... Uh, any uh, of the uh, addressing of any aspects of it, any part of it, um, from um, the coaching to the players to what's around the corner. Uh, uh, on a personal basis, I'm, I'm floored. And so uh, uh, not that there's any world's smallest violin for me being floored. I get that. I understand that. And uh, I know where the responsibility starts and ends. And I've got that real clear, and I know that. But that's not the point. The point is that uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, disappointed for everybody.